to you. We turn to you. The 
His blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who claims to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before him seek this refrain with us who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one can. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb. For the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. For oh, every knee will bow before Him. the cross for even in your suffering 
you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one god of glory majesty praise forever to the king of kings and the morning that you rose all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born and the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel and shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me call a sermon outline, and that'll give you uh, <laughs> some of the passages we uh, plan to reference today. Also, if you would, uh, if you have a Bible, you can flip it open to John. Uh, no, we can't fit everything we're going to talk about uh, on the outline, so uh, to have the book open to John would be a good thing. Uh, we're going to try to stick with John today, by the way, as we go through um, uh, the uh, Palm Sunday account. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this great privilege to be able to have gathered to worship you in song, and we can't uh, really imagine what it would have been to be in Jerusalem or just outside 2,000 years ago when you were coming in with an absolutely resolute heart focused on a cross. A lot of cheering going on, worship, praising, and yet they, like us, didn't know even the beginning of it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you did on Good Friday, and thank you that we can celebrate you as our resurrected King. Thank you for this uh, uh, sight that we have to be able to read the Gospel of John, and uh, pray that you work and move in our hearts in your perfect way. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. There are, uh, uh, there's one gospel, that's what Christ came to do. There's uh, four authors that wrote about uh, his life, uh, or at least part of his life, mostly his uh, life of ministry, uh, directly. We call those the gospels uh, as well, so that, that word is used in two ways. Um, each of them is a, um, a narrative that is not just a jumbled pile of stories. Uh, each of the authors were guided by God to choose the stories and the, um, the teachings uh, to get across their theological point or points, depending on their audience and the guidance of God. Now, what we commonly do here is we'll, um, on uh, uh, these special holidays, um, uh, uh, Christmas and, and Easter in particular, uh, we'll take all four Gospels typically and we will chronologically piece them together to get the fuller picture because <laughs> we're Western people and that's kind of how we look at stuff. You know, give me all the details, every detail you, you possibly have, Lord, please. And so commonly that's our style, but every once in a while it is good, uh, probably more than every once in a while, it's good to break away and just look specifically at one gospel at a time. Now we're going to be looking at uh, John today, um, just simply because that's the one we have chosen. And he has selected certain teachings and stories to get across his big idea. Again, many, many, many things to choose from. He's just selected by the Spirit of God, the ones that he has chosen. So we'll cover a few of those themes leading into Palm Sunday today. John was one of the uh, 12, we're pretty sure he was the writer of this, uh, he uh, lists himself. Uh, he was one of the 12 um, apostles and he was transformed radically as the others were when he saw the resurrected Lord after three and a half years of walking with him. He's writing, we're guessing around, he's the last one to write a gospel and he's writing around probably 85 to 90 uh, AD. So another 50, 60 years after the uh, resurrection, um, roughly speaking. Um, the goal of his gospel is listed by him specifically in chapter 20 and verse 31. And that's where in your sermon outline, uh, that's the first passage we have given to you. Uh, let's just go ahead and start with uh, what he's shooting at. You know, John, what are you trying to get us to do? What are you trying to get us to believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Why have you chosen the uh, teachings and the, the uh, accounts that you have chosen when there's many, many others that you could have chosen? Why did you choose these? And he's going to be very specific. And he's got a mostly a, a uh, Greco-Roman audience in mind, more than a Jewish audience, it appears. But he certainly has a, Jew a Jewish audience in, in mind as well. And so he gives us these words in John chapter 20, verse 31. Uh, this is the climax, I believe, of where the whole gospel is going. Thomas is eight days after the resurrection. He hasn't yet met the resurrected Lord. And upon meeting him, and he's in doubt, as all the disciples were in doubt, uh, upon meeting him, his response is, my Lord and my God. And unless you think that's just some, uh, some guy uh, swearing, you know, because he's caught off guard, uh, this is a good Jewish boy. <laughs> it's not the slightest chance. Uh, and in the, in the, in the uh, Jesus would have corrected him for sure. Uh, there's not the slightest chance. This, the, these words are used in an irreverent way. He has come to believe that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God. And that's where the Gospel of John leads us. And John says these words, verse 30 of chapter 20, many other signs, therefore Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Now there's many, many things to write about, but these have been written, in other words, I've selected these, that you might believe or trust that Jesus is the Christ, that's the anointed one the prophesied one from when God made Adam and Eve, and they fell. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
and that believing you might have life in his name. That's John's goal, and that is our goal this morning and as we move through the Easter account. Now, uh, I don't know uh, what all mystery, but most of us like mystery uh, stories, mystery novels or mystery movies, that kind of thing. Uh, that's kind of part of, of how God's created us, uh, that inquisitive nature, and we, we like that kind of stuff. One of my favorite guys uh, is Columbo. The young pops have no clue what I just said. Not a clue, okay? But the older folk, you know what I'm talking about, all right? I, 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 man, it's just, that's like the classic, okay? Uh, if you don't know, just YouTube him, and he, a classic. Now, the, the deal about Columbo is he's just, he's a dude like you and me, you know, a little klutzy, and yet he teaches us that if you're going to figure out the clue, you've got to look close. You've got to take into account everything. And then you have to start piecing stuff together. Now, I want to suggest to you that's exactly the way the Gospel of John is written. It's not written to be kind of just a speed read. You're going to miss all, like, basically almost everything. It's written to be a piece of literature where if you don't really want to know if you don't look really, really close and start adding up clue after clue after clue after clue, you'll read it and not know who Christ is. You start adding it up, though, and you will come away just like Timothy. My Lord and my God. God in humanness is exactly where this gospel leads us to. And I would say even a tenth of, it, uh, of the information in here leads us there, let alone the way it's constructed. Brilliant construction. Let's go ahead and dig into it if we could. John chapter 1 and verse 1. Again, you have this in your uh, sermon notes and uh, give them to you so you can write on, on uh, the notes and transfer the best notes to your Bible. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Uh, this is about the Word. In the beginning was the Word. Now, I apologize to the theologians in the group. I know that I'm going to miss it. I'm, this is a broad overview to get you excited about reading John for yourself. I know I'm going to miss all your favorite, at least many of your favorite ideas. I got it. But I got to do the best I can just to draw attention to the big ideas. And there's so much here. We could spend weeks on chapter 1. I, I get it. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the logos, the word. And for the Greek mind, that's, that's probably an impersonal force that created everything. The Stoics definitely held to this. A lot of the Greek philosophers held to this. Very popular. That there's, there's an order to things. There's got to be some kind of logic, some kind of mind out there that has put everything together. For the Jewish people, it's pretty obvious. Uh, God spoke everything into existence. It's, the, you know, the, it's all about living by his words or his word. And so those are, uh, I think John chooses that to go, let's talk about the logic behind the universe, the creator. He's not impersonal. He is very personal, and he's very much with us. Let's talk about him, not it. And the word was with God, and the word was God. God John just gets right to the point. He was with God. He was God. With God was God. How does that work? How can you be with somebody and be that person? Three persons, one essence. We call that the Trinity. Where Trinity is not in the Bible, but the teaching regarding the Trinity is. And you say, well, let's figure this out mathematically. I'm a logical person. We're talking about logic already. Uh, one plus one, plus one, Father, plus Son, plus Holy Spirit. If they're each God, one plus one plus one equals three. Well, that's not one, that's three. Well, let me, let me give you another mathematical formula to shove into your pipe. Infinity plus infinity plus infinity equals what? Yeah, okay. We're, we're, over, we're way above our pay grade right now. 
But, mathma but mathematically, logically, it works. Even though you and I can't understand God. We're like children, and you're coming up to try to explain physics or calculus or something to a, to a small child. How, where do you start? Or a computer, how a computer works. Where do you start? And so we just take it. We go, God's bigger than us. Three, one. Trinity, one God, three persons. He was with God. He was God. Verse 2. He was in the beginning with God, and all things have been made by him. Now, notice the language here. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Why that second line? He already said it. Well, because he wants us to get it. If something has come into being, it came into being by him. He has not come into being is the point. And everything that has come into being came into being by the word who is the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll find out later in this passage. Verse 4, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. What's the idea here? Life and light, a theme in John's gospel, are going to go together. When we're given uh, 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 the, the, the new birth, we're given spiritual life, the lights come on. You remember that? remember that day? If you don't remember that day, we're praying today would be that day. Life, light, they go together. Verse 5, and by the way, we're going to read Jesus' lines. I am the resurrection and the life. I am, that phrase, we'll get to that momentarily. Or the light. I am the light of the world. The one who illuminates everybody, turns on the light so that they can see sin and righteousness and judgment and God and all things good. Verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness. For John, there's two realms. And for us, there is, quite frankly, there's the realm up in heaven and there's the realm that is here and he contrasts those two realms all the way through as he contrasts light and darkness a major theme uh, the light shines in the darkness that means in this world and the darkness did not and this is a, a beautiful word by john comprehend could mean uh, grab and abuse or it could mean understand what which does it mean yes both, as is really common in John's writings. They, people, didn't, people were not able to grab him before his hour came. And then, at the right time, they did. We'll find that in the book of John. Also, they did not understand why he came. And from the very front edge of John, chapter 1, for example, verse 29, he is the Lamb of God. Chapter 1, who came to take care of the sin problem in the world. In uh, chapter 2 and verse 4, um, he says, my hour has not yet come. That's going to be a theme throughout the book. He's got an hour when he's going to die on the cross. And nobody can touch him until that hour has come. Major theme in John. Chapter 2 and verse uh, 19, destroy this temple. Again, beginning of John, all the way through. This is the first Passover that where they were. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it back again referring to his body. From the very front edge in the Gospel of John, Jesus knew exactly what was coming down the pike. By the way, the, 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 I have to say this every year, the nonsense that's on the TV, these, you know, uh, Dr. Formaldehyde, all the, I mean, just unbelievable nonsense of Jesus just got caught up in the mix and somehow ended up on a cross. It's, it's like, that's like loony. That's the exact opposite of what the Bible says. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he got himself hung on the cross on exactly that day. More information on that as we go. Verse 9, he was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But chapter 3, verse 19 and following, people because of evilness, choose to not want to be in the light. Just like cockroaches, running from the light. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That's a heavy line. Made everybody, made everything, gave us the image of God on the inside. We should have identified with him, and we, cho we chose not to. Verse 11, he came to his own. That would probably be referring to the Jewish people. And those who were his own chose to not receive him. Overall, that's the case. Not entirely. But 
as many as receive him, and here's our goal, here's John's goal in chapter 20, verse 31. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Who specifically? To those who believe in his name. And his name is in his person. Who is able to be a child of God? Who does God make? Who does God adopt into his family? And God regenerate their hearts so that they're a child of God. Give them life so that they're a child of God. Whoever believes in him. John 3.16 is a core passage in this book. Repeated many in many locations. Whoever no matter what you've done, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Amen? And that's the whole message of John. How can you, when you learn about this guy and the, and the eyewitnesses, John and many, and all of them went to their deaths. John was, was on an Isle of Patmos in, in a penal colony, but basically all of them went to their deaths, never recanting. No, nobody, none of them recanted having seen the resurrected Lord. And when we learn this, what we learn about him, how can we not trust him? Believe in him, and you're made a child of God. Who were born, verse 13, not of blood, nor of flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. John chapter 3 and verse 7, a few verses later. Nick, Nicodemus, religious leader. You're a religious leader, you're top of the pile, admired by everybody. Nick, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Nick, you must be born again. Well, how, can, how can that happen? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, verse 14, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And so all the way through, from the very beginning, Jesus is preaching the gospel and John records it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. That's the point of this book. What's his glory? His character, his person, who he is, his attributes. He's God in humanness, God veiled in a body. The word, eternal God, becomes flesh, takes on a body and dwells, tabernacles, tented, among us is the Greek word. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that is exactly who Christ is. Uh, he says to his followers, He who has seen me has seen the Father. I am God in humanness in essence. Uh, as he called God his father throughout this uh, letter, um, the Jewish leadership wanted to kill him for blasphemy. They understood that he was making himself out to be God, and that's exactly what he was doing. Verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law comes through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. The law brings conviction to sin. Christ comes. He's the perfect sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sin. Verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, asked Moses. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, the only begotten God, the only begotten God who is in the bosom, who is close to the breast of the Father, has described, revealed, explained him. And that's exactly what we see as we work through. So John, in his prologue, sets out what's going to be happening. At the end of the book, he's very plain. I am writing these things. I'm choosing these accounts and these, and these sayings, these teachings, that you might believe and believing you have life in his name. John, at the front end, says this is the word. This is God and humus, humanness that we're talking about. So he gives us a hint at the front end that most of the folks did not have, but we have it as we're reading through this testimony. Now, so many things to choose from. In the last number of weeks, I am in agony going, <laughs> what do we pick? And so uh, this is what we landed on. I hope, hopefully this is by the Spirit of God. First of all, the I am statements. You go, what's, what's, what's the big deal? Check this out. This is Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14 and following. Moses has been called by God to lead the people out of Egypt into the promised land. All right, he's just a guy. And God's calling him. And Moses is going, okay, when, when I talk to the folks and they say, you know, the God of our fathers has called me to do this, like, 
what's your name? That's a pretty good question. Yeah, who, who, who should I say, what, what, is, what is your name? You know, the Egyptian gods have names and stuff. Like, who, what is your name? And God told him very specifically, tell them, I am has sent you. Because that's my identity. I am self-existent. Never created outside of time and space, matter and energy. I don't know that Moses put all that together, but I am. I'm, I am the one that is, that is more than because e eternity. I mean, God created time too. I am. I am the self-existent one. Tell them I sent you. That's my name forever to all generations. Now, Jesus comes along and he says this in John chapter 8 and verse 58. And he said it many times. This is one of the times. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, this is to the religious leaders, people that are hanging out. They're talking about Abraham and how glorious he was. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. They knew exactly what he was saying. I saw Abraham, I created Abraham. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. He was claiming to be God to anybody who was listening. Here's some more I am usages, and we learn about the character of God and humanness. Jesus came to reveal the glory of God, so uh, check this, and the glory of God is his character, everything that's about him, so check out these uh, fairly quickly if you would. John chapter uh, 6 and uh, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, he who believes in me will never Thirst. In other words, I am, not my father is, listen, I am the giver and the sustainer of life. I am. Direct reference to being God. Number two, John chapter 8 and verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of the world. Of life. See how those two words go together. Regeneration, new birth, and light, illumination. They go together, the hand in hand. Uh, people that are born again, they have the lights turned on, so to speak. Uh, we'll see this expression again in chapter 9 and verse 5. I am the light of the world. After he uh, was, was uh, in the process of healing a, uh, a blind guy. In other words, I am the one that gives people the ability to see. Not my father although that's true of my father, I am claiming to be God. Uh, number three, John chapter 10 and verse 7. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door for the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and shall go out and in and find pasture. I came that folks might have life and have it abundantly. But the way into salvation is me. I am the way of salvation. I am the door. You don't enter except through me, right? And so uh, he is the door. I am the door. Again, the I am expression. John 10, verse 11, same passage. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Probably referring to two things. One, he's going to die on that cross for his sheep. But he's also the one who would give up his life to protect his sheep. Setting an example for all shepherds. Verse, uh, number 5, John 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies physically, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. That was at the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, tomb of Lazarus before raising him from the dead. He illustrated what he's talking about by raising a man from the dead. He is life. He is the resurrection. John chapter 14, verse 6, he says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not I point to it, I am it. I am the way, I'm the truth, I am the life. I'm the truth. Anything that in any way contradicts me is wrong. 
I am the truth. I'm the measure of truth. I am the life. I'm the one who gives people life that come to me. No one comes to the Father but through me. These are, these are monumental claims. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. My Father is the vine. What's he saying there? I am the one who gives life. If you're not connected to me, you don't have life. If you're connected to me, you have life. How can anybody but God make such a statement? I am life. I am the sustainer. And so, then the climax, there's a number of other I am statements, but the climax, I think in my mind, is John chapter 18 and uh, verse 4 and following, this is in Gethsemane, uh, when uh, Judas is betraying him, he has a big uh, uh, a group of soldiers with him, and muckety-mucks and whoever, and they're coming out to arrest Jesus on that night, they're going to take him back and try him and hang him on a cross, and so as they're coming out, um, Jesus asks, who are you seeking? He knows exactly what's going on, uh, and they, they tell him, and his response is, we're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, his response is what? I am. If you have in your version the word he, it's in italics, it's, he simply said, I am, with probably great authority. What do they do? They fell backwards to the ground. He is plainly God in humanness. And woe to anybody who makes him out any different way. And yet full of grace and truth. Signs. Let me draw your attention to uh, some of the accounts, um, or I would say even all of the mir miracles, which are, most of them are called signs. What's a sign all about? It's a clue. It points to some, some, if, if Jesus calls something a sign, it's pointing to something. When you have a sign, it's pointing in a direction. And so here's the first sign. This is, for some of you all, your favorite miracle. Might be the only one you even know. Now, why in the world would this be the first miracle? Well, like, he calls it the first miracle. There's a wedding. This is very early on. He's got a couple of disciples with him. He hasn't called them all yet, I don't think. Uh, got a few disciples with him. And um, his mom comes to him, Mary, and she goes, they're out of wine. And his response is, what is that to you and to me? I don't think that was, that was a, he wasn't putting her down. He's, he's bringing her along, along with everybody else. I think he's very respectful, obviously, to his, to his mom. And, and so he's asking her a question, so she thinks, and everybody listening, and us as well, what is that? And so right now, we're supposed to do that. We're there at the wedding, and we're there with Jesus and his mom, and we're, we're, we're right beside, and we're listening to the conversation, and he asked the question, what is this to you and to me? And we're supposed to think right now. And he goes on to say, and here's the clue to the entire, why did Jesus do this? Was he just doing it to, to help this couple save face? Well, I mean, that was part of it. He loved them. That's part of it. He says, my hour has not yet come. What's he referring to? He's drawn Mary and everybody's attention to his hour. Everything he's fixing to do is about his hour, the hour of his crucifixion. So my hour has not yet come. Mary looks at the servants and goes, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. <laughs> Mary, I don't know how much she knew, but she's a bright lady and she knew he was up to something. But he's displaying something about his hour coming. And so she just goes, I don't know what's going on. And, and there were six stone pots used for purification. They, nobody drank out of them. They were used for ceremonial purification a, 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 as a symbol of what uh, God needs to do in the heart. And so he asked them to fill uh, the pots with water. Uh, they do. And he says, take some of it out. Take it to the, uh, you know, the, the uh, 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 guy, the, the headmaster uh, that's overseeing the whole wedding. And, um, and, and, and see what he thinks. And so they do, and they, they take it to him, he tastes it, and he goes, this is, you know, this is like, you, you save the best wine for, for last uh, to, the, uh, to the groom. And we have these words. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. <laughs> and you're going, what does this mean? 
And since we're really limited on time, just think about all of the many references to Jesus being the groom, must be in the bride. I know that's kind of weird for guys, but anyway. Um, and, and that's coming up in John chapter 3, for example. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb coming up in Revelation, which John wrote, chapter 19. Uh, there's, we're going to be the bride forever, Revelation 21. And numerous other illustrations regarding the, the whole bride-bridegroom thing. But we have these words in Isaiah 25, verse 6. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet... Talking about the people of God coming before him at that last time, or the, the beginning of, uh, of eternity, if you will, uh, 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 after this age, I should say. A banquet of good wine, great food, refined aged wine. Now, there's a few of us here that you can't even hear what I'm talking about right now because wine's evil, wine's evil. And, and you... If I could say, I love you, you've got to grow up. Okay, that, that sounds disrespectful, but honestly, there's so many passages in the Bible, you can't under... I read commentators, and because when Jesus turned water into wine, they just, they, they're flipping out. They can't, they have no idea to connect with what Jesus is really doing. Uh, drunkenness obviously is wrong. But here we've got God having a banquet with aged wine, refined aged wine. And uh, death is gone and tears are gone. Let us rejoice and be glad in the God of our salvation. And that's uh, Isaiah chapter 25. So what's going on here? Jesus came to furnish wine. But what wine? All of these things are a picture. All of these, these signs are a picture of a, of a, of a reality far greater than the, than, than, the, than, the, than the miracle. What's he pointing at? Jesus came... To do what? To furnish the wine. And so with the Lord's Supper, what do we do? We have the bread and we have the wine celebrating the blood of Jesus Christ. My hour has not yet come. Think about it. Christ came to give us the wine that will never run out. That saves us forever. His blood. And so again, that's a picture of an eternal celebration. I'm going, my hour has come. He says at the end, when it's time to go to the cross, my hour has come. He's going to face that hour and go through the agony of the hour and shed his blood so that his bride can have the privilege of having a cup of eternal joy forever. That's what's going on in the passage. And I'm not spiritualizing, I don't believe. Okay, I'm doing exactly what John has led us to do. Uh, again, my time is, uh, i got to keep going here. That's the, uh, that's the wine thing. No, uh, the second sign, what's it pointing to? Roman's son healed. Um, like, what, is, what is this all about? Well, it's, it's a, it, that's in John chapter 4 and verse 46 and following. A certain Roman guy, and he comes and he goes, uh, man, my son is, is really ill, can you heal him? And Jesus goes, um, uh, your son will, son will live. And the, the Roman guy wants Jesus to go with him, but Jesus doesn't go with him. He just goes, your son will live. The Roman guy believes him and leaves, and then eventually a servant comes out and says, uh, by the way, it's about um, a 20-mile journey between the two places. And uh, the, uh, his servant says, uh, your son is, uh, is recovering. He's fine. And it says the guy believed, which is the point of the story. And this is the second sign. What is this all about? Jesus is the restorer. To all who trust him. Jesus is the great restorer of life. And so it's symbolized. That's a physical picture symbolizing something that is far greater. Number three. Of like kind. This passage moves right into this, this next passage. Chapter 5 verse 1. Where we've got a lame guy. And in this passage I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus is demonstrating. Not only is, is he the restorer but he's also the eternal rest because now he's healing a guy. And yes, it's the Sabbath. And of course, uh, the Jewish folks, uh, the Jewish leadership were not real interested in people being healed on the Sabbath. Uh, that would be a terrible thing. And he heals on the Sabbath, tells the guy to take up his pallet and why he's a lame guy. And he does. Jewish leaders are very, very upset. Jesus says these words uh, to them in the hearing of many people. Verse 17 of chapter 4. He answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. 
And the Jewish leadership understood that the only person who could work on the Sabbath and not break the law would be God. What's he saying? I'm God. My father works on the Sabbath. I work on the Sabbath. you got to figure it out. For this cause, the Jews were seeking to kill him. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his father, making himself equal with God. They, they understood. Fourth sign, feeding of the 5,000. What's this all about? I am the bread of life. And so, uh, without going through the whole account, you can read it on your own. Chapter 6, verse 1 and following. We've got uh, Jesus feeding 5,000 and 12 baskets of bread were left over. That's from a small lunch. That's a, from a lunchable, basically. And, uh, and we've got uh, 12 baskets of bread left over. Um, and that, par that, that story is not done yet. G uh, Paul, uh, John puts another story in the middle of it, which is because it happened this way. And so John chapter 6, verse 15, Jesus walks on water. Uh, as the disciples were in a boat crossing over, big storm, and Jesus walks on water. What is this all about? He's the Lord of creation. Who, who can walk on water? Um, and then goes back to um, the uh, story about the, uh, the bread and the, uh, and the fish, um, and he says this, verse 33 of chapter 6, the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Okay? They go, well, give us this bread. Jesus says, verse 35, I am the bread of life. I'm the one that has come from heaven to give life to the world. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never hunger thirst. Picture of a far greater reality that if you're hungry for reality, for truth, for love, for family, for all that is good, come to Christ. You will never hunger or thirst again is the big idea. Uh, then the next uh, of, of the signs is number six, the seven of them, uh, plus the resurrection. Number six is, I am the light of the world. Blind guy. And uh, blind guys don't just receive their sight. It's a, we can't do anything today. Uh, a man blind from birth, a little bit of conversation about how he got blind, and Jesus introduces what he's going to do by saying, I am, got a blind guy, I am the light of the world. And so where is Jesus going to go with this? He spits on the ground, makes some clay, puts it on his eyes. Guy goes and washes. He can see. Pharisees get wind of it. It was the Sabbath. There it is again. Pharisees uh, uh, give this guy grief, uh, then he call, they call his parents in, they give them grief, then they call him back in, they give him more grief, uh, they just can't, they can't uh, go with this, and it, this, whole, this is where the story ends up. Jesus finds the blind guy, after he'd been uh, you know, taken up and down by the Pharisees, and he says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? He's going, show me the Son of Man, and uh, you know, I'll let you know. And he says, I'm the guy. Verse 38, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. What's the point? What does sight, when Jesus gives sight, and it's, it's the Greek word proskuneo, which is to bow down. Only God is to be worshiped. Jesus received his worship and the worship of his disciples out in the boat, by the way, and other places. Okay, so only God is to be worshiped. Jesus lets this guy worship him. It's the result of sight. What is going on here? When we have spiritual sight, we see sin. We see God. We see truth. We see Christ. And the only place we can end up is proskuneoed on the ground before Christ worshiping him. That's what sight leads to. And only God gives sight. The Lord Jesus Christ is God. That's exactly what's going on here. The Pharisee said to him, well, he, 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 he says this, For judgment I've come into the world, that those who do not see might see. That would be you and me. And those who see might become blind. What is that? The Pharisee said, are you talking about us? Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. 
But because you say we see, your sin remains. It's those who are self-righteous that are completely incapable of receiving Christ and seeing. And they stay blind in their self-righteousness. Those who come to Christ are given sight. They believe and they end up worshiping him. And Jesus Christ is God and humanness who can give that sight. Moving on from here, sign number seven. We've got the uh, raising of a dead guy. Lazarus, you all know the story. Chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, used it a lot of funeral services, and rightly so. Uh, word comes to Jesus about uh, Lazarus um, uh, being, uh, uh, being very, very sick. Uh, and, um, and, and Jesus tells the boys, we're going we're gonna to hang on a bit. And then, again, the, the, word, the word is actually he is dead. And um, uh, Jesus says, uh, we're going to hang on a bit and, 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 and wait. And the reason is, is because we love them. And that's the, the notes given by John. Because we love them, we're going to wait. And he gets there, and, and Lazarus is four days dead. The point is, he's already in the decomposition, he's decomposing mode. And Jesus says to Martha, I, this is verse 25 of chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. I am. There's that expression again. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Uh, some great exchanges uh, take place, and Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, showing that in him is life, and he raises from spiritual death anybody he desires to do so, and, who believe, you know, and, and then uh, he uh, certainly uh, will raise us one day as well. So he says the words, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes forth. Some uh, squealers go and, and, and tell the, uh, the religious leadership. This sets up Palm Sunday and Good Friday. And so they go and tell, and they have a council. This is recorded in your notes, by the way. Verse 49, there's a council convened. Um, uh, verse 46 and following, my, my bad. Verse 47, there's a council that is convened. And they're talking among each other, going, this is way out of control. Everybody's going to be believing in him. And Caiaphas goes, y'all don't understand what's going on. We need to do what's expedient. Uh, verse 50, um, verse 50 uh, it's expedient for one man to die than for the entire nation to perish. Uh, this was a prophecy, though he was an ungodly man, claiming to be the, uh, the godly leader of Israel, an ungodly man. But God used him to prophesy that Jesus would, and die, would indeed die for the people. And so they planned, they continued, I guess we put it, uh, planned together to kill him. They're done with him. Verse 55, the Passover of the Jews is at hand. Many folks are going up. It was a mandatory festival, if you're a good Jewish guy, uh, to go up and typically bring your family. Uh, as they were there, they were seeking for Jesus because about six weeks earlier was the Lazarus thing. And the chief priests had put up wanted posters and given orders that everybody knew where Jesus was. They would turn him in. And Jesus, uh, therefore, six days before the Passover, comes to Bethany, where Lazarus also was, and they have a dinner for him. Mary anoints his feet, and uh, there's a little bit of scuffle, and Judas goes, what are you doing? That, that, that's, that's a lot of money wasted on Jesus' feet. We could have used this for the poor. And Jesus says to her, let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. He knows exactly what's coming down the pike. The multitudes are gathering. Uh, the chief priests want to put Lazarus to death as well. Uh, this is uh, chapter 12 and verse uh, 10 uh, because he was the evidence that Jesus can raise dead people. And then we have these words, and we'll conclude with these words today. This is Palm Sunday. All of that sets up this day. This is verse 12 now of uh, chapter 12 in the book of John. On the next day... The great multitude who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went out to greet him, thus the name Palm Sunday. And they're crying out, according to John's record, they're crying out many things, but John records three things. First, Hosanna. Uh, we sang a song, Hosanna. I meant to mention this before the song. I forgot to. Uh, we, we come, it's, it's in a lot of songs. What does the word Hosanna mean? Uh, it's kind of a twofer uh, kind, of a, kind of a word. On the one hand, it's just a general word for praise. We praise you, Lord, basically is what we're saying. Hosanna, we praise you. Uh, but another use of it is, Lord, save us. 
And so it's used in both ways depending on the context. How is it used here? Probably both ways. They're wanting to be saved from Rome, and they are also praising him as Messiah. Second thing that they are crying out, and these are all happening together, these three expressions and, and many others, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, Old Testament reference uh, that, that they are using, uh, but the name of the Lord is in the authority of God. We believe as a multitude, and by the way, the multitude's going to be, um, some of the historians estimate that uh, 10 years from here, there was more than 2 million that gathered in Jerusalem for this festival. So this is, this is uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So anyway, so this, I'm just going to say hundreds of thousands, I don't know. I mean, it's huge, it's just a mass of humanity. And so, um, uh, blessed is he who comes in the name. So you've got all these people crying out, so a, a, a group, thousands are moving with Jesus toward Jerusalem. Many more thousands are coming out, and you've got the sea of humanity converging together. They're making a red carpet treatment out of coats and out of branches and whatever. Uh, they're crying out, Hosanna. Could you imagine being one of the Pharisees? Uh, crying out, Hosanna, which is they're worshiping him as Savior. Uh, they're saying that he's coming in the authority of the Lord. And they are calling him the king of Israel, the eternal king, the one in the lineage of David. This is the Messiah, in essence, is what they're saying. And Jesus finds a donkey, sits on it, which kings could sit on donkeys. There's a few illustrations of, of that in the Old Testament. But this is a very young donkey, his feet are dragging on the ground, so to speak. You know. And so this is a very humble act. Uh, Luke says that he's crying on the way in. John doesn't record that part. And so the disciples didn't understand all that was taking place. I'm in verse 16, but they would put things together afterwards. Verse 17, the multitude who were there were bearing witness to him. And also the whole thing with Lazarus. Verse 18, for this cause, the multitude went out to meet him because they heard that he had performed this sign, the sign of raising a dead guy. And then our last verse, verse 19, the Pharisees therefore said to one another, you're not doing any good. They're saying this to one another. The whole world has gone after this guy. What are we going to do? So you got the wanted posters out. We're going to, we're, if anybody knows where he is, remember, you got you to tell us. And we're going to grab him. Does anybody know where he is? The entire multitude knows where he is. They're hailing him as the king, the Messiah, as he rides in. And Jesus has his mind set on a cross as he comes in. And they have their mind set on probably a Messiah that's going to overthrow Rome, most likely. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this time to be able to gather for a few minutes. And we just uh, skimmed a little bit of the truth that uh, you have guided John to record. Uh, Lord Jesus, all of this is about you. And so thank you for saying what you said, for doing what you did, for the signs, and also this, this way that you have a working in us. This, this is a far cry from an in-your-face kind of thing. We're, we're needing to pick up clues as to who you are, but when we look carefully in context at the clues you've given to us, they're pretty undeniable. You are God in humanness. And you came to die on a cross in our place. And friend, if you've never spoken these words to him, I'm pleading with you to do so. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me on that cross. I don't know how you reached into my life to take all my sin, but I believe you did. Every thought, every word, every action I've ever done that doesn't line up with your word. On your body, on the cross, you were punished in my place. I believe the testimony of John that if I believe in you, I receive the gift of eternal life. Lord Jesus, I place my faith in you as my king, as my savior. I trust you. No turning back. Father, I pray that with each person here who is walking with you, that you'd guide them into your perfect will this week in their witness and their testimonies regarding what you have done for us and are doing in us. Be honored this week in our thoughts, in our words, in everything that we say and do, including our hosannas to you. 
In your name we pray. Amen. This area is open if you want prayer for anything, especially if you want to trust Christ as Savior. Uh, small groups for all ages following this time. If you want to figure out where to go, let us know. And then a uh, lunch following that time. We invite everybody to come and join us. God bless each one of you. God make you a blessing.